This is a letter that the Rebbe wrote in the year Tovshin Vav 1946, before he actually became Rebbe, a response to somebody who asked him a question about tzedakah, about giving charity, that it's a well-known thing that you're not supposed to give tzedakah at night. Okay. Ever heard of that? No, no. no. So it's very well known. That, um, <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's when people come to the house and knock on the door asking for tzedakah. So, so yeah, you can say, that. I'm sorry, it says in, the, in, the, in Kabbalah that you're not supposed to give tzedakah at night. There is such a thing. So somebody wrote to the rabbi asking for an explanation for this. And what does this mean? Is this, is this a fantastic way out of giving tzedakah when somebody asks you? Sorry, it's just after sunset. What's the reason behind it then? And what's the reason behind it? Why, why, why would you not be able to give tzedakah at night? Tzedakah is a beautiful mitzvah to give charity. Why would you not be allowed to do it at night? So somebody asked the Rebbe about it, and the Rebbe gave a fa- fascinating analysis of this custom, uh, the meaning behind it, the restrictions and limitations of it, and, uh, and a very deep insight into what it means. So at the bottom of the page there, it would be 292. Shiloh, the question is, but Nogad Metzavah, there's a mitzvah, uh, there's a book called Nogad Metzavah, going through the customs of Shachris, of the morning prayers, Issa, it says there, Night is not an appropriate time to give tzedakah. That's, that's one of the sources. On the surface, it would seem the opposite, that night time is the most appropriate time to give tzedakah. Why? Because according to Kabbalah, night time is a time of gvurah. It's a time when the supernal attribute of strictness, of justice, of harshness, is more apparent. It would be appropriate to give a lot of tzedakah at night in order to sweeten the gvuras. What does this mean? The fact that we have day and night, that there's time when the sun shines and there's time when the sun disappears from our view and it gets dark, is a reflection of a spiritual reality. The sun shining represents chesed, kindness, divine bestowing. The sun being hidden and darkness represents gevurah, the time of harshness, of strictness, of justice, of uh, divine concealment. And so, therefore, nighttime generally is considered a time of negative energy. There's more negative energy in the world at night. That's reflected in the fact that it's dark. Not because it's dark, it's the other way around. It's dark because it's a time of negative energy, of, of negative divine energy. That's why it says in the Gemara, you shouldn't walk alone at night. Um, at night, the powers of evil have more, more of a, a stance. There's a thing about saying Tehillim at night as well. There is such a thing. Um, Torah Shbichsav as well, to, to learn Torah, the written Torah. It's di- all for different reasons. Uh, what would you say to only, you only say Tilam at night, well, as a part of davening, yes. Shiremala. Yeah, there's many Tilam we say, but, but, but to say to say Tilam as Tehillim, uh-huh. you don't say at night, your daily Tilam you say during the day. Uh, to say Tilam for somebody, only only when there's a very urgent need, you say Tilam at night. It's a very rare thing, generally not. So, but that's, but that's for, for a slightly different reason. Here, uh, for Tzedakah, we'll see, is, is, is for another reason. So the questioner is suggesting it's, it's an appropriate time to give tzedakah at night. Why? Nighttime is a time of gvura, of harsh judgment. And giving tzedakah is an act of chesed, of kindness. So should we not sweeten the nighttime, counter the, the forces of evil and darkness and uh, harshness that are at night by doing an act of chesed, giving tzedakah at night? And yet the custom is not to. So, so why indeed? That's, that's the question. Chuva. So here's the answer that the Rebbe offers. Yesh lahosef oid shail al shalosei. Like a, a very typically Jewish answer, that you should actually, your question, you should, a, you should ask even more. I'll, I'll make your question even stronger. Vihi, and what, what is that? Mahu nimuk hashinuyim sheyesh binyan zeh bekisfi arizal. That why we find in the writings of the Arizal, Rabbi Yitzchak Luria, the major source of Kabbalah, in his own writings we find seeming contradictions on this topic. Betama she'en liten tzedakah ba'arvis. In the reason why you shouldn't give tzedakah at night, as we will quote later, that there are actually contradictory things within the writings of the Rizal itself. So, this all we will analyze. The bottom paragraph. So, to understand all this, we first have to preface with another idea. There's two attitudes or two approaches as far as the timing of mitzvahs. There's two reasons for mitzvahs having a specific time. 
Aleph, the first reason is, Mahusa mitzvah, Mahusa zman, asiyosa masimim zelazeh. Sometimes we find that the essence of a mitzvah and the time in which you're supposed to do the mitzvah match. They're appropriate for each other. They, they work together well. Dugma Ladova, for example, Talmud Torah b'chatzah is layla. It's very appropriate to learn Torah at midnight. Smack in the middle of the night. Midnight doesn't mean 12 a.m. It means halfway between sunset and sunrise which is different every night. Sometimes it's one o'clock in the morning. But to learn Torah at that time, at midnight, is a fantastic thing to do. It's, 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 it's advised. It says in the Gemara, it says the David Amalek used to wake up every night at midnight and learn Torah till the morning. King David did that. Uh, some great Mukabalim would always do that. Wake up at midnight to learn Torah. Why is it so good to learn Torah at midnight? Because Sha'az Asi Kujabrichu Lishtasha in Sadikaiba Ganadin. Because it says in the Zayar that at midnight every night Hashem goes to Ganadin, to the Garden of Eden, and he spends time with Sadikim at that time. He connects with the Sadikim at that time at midnight. And so to learn Torah is to connect to that energy of Hashem uniting with the Sadikim at midnight. And when you learn at that time there's a special connection you have. I've been doing great. Yeah, I can see on your face. So um, so that's that's, that's why learning at midnight is a good thing. So what, why? Because the learning at midnight fits the time. It's an appropriate time. It's the time when Hashem connects with Sadikim. There's a special light that's shining. So the mitzvah fits to the time. Top of the next, um, call, call, uh, next page. After the brackets. Or another example of a mitzvah that fits to the time. It says, You're not allowed to light a fire on Shabbos. Why are you not allowed to light a fire on Shabbos? Why is lighting a fire forbidden on Shabbos? Because at that time, at the time of Shabbos, on Shabbos, all fires are extinguished. There's no fire burning in the heavens on Shabbos, it says in Kabbalah. So therefore, don't burn a fire on Shabbos. Shabbos is a time of uh, divine love and grace and happiness and peace. Fire, in, in the mystical sense, represents anger and rage which is not appropriate for Shabbos. It's not a Shabbos thing. And so we don't like fires on Shabbos because in the heavens there are no fires on Shabbos. The fire is extinguished on Shabbos. It's a time of peace. We know that Gehenna itself, purgatory, which is a purgatory of fire, spiritual fire, is quenched on Shabbos. On Shabbos. There's no fire on Shabbos in Gehenna. In the in the base of Mikdash, they were allowed because that fire is a holy fire. It doesn't reflect the fire of Shabbos. Sorry? Why can't you put out a fire on Shabbos? Because that, that's still getting involved with fire first, first of all. You should leave fire alone. You shouldn't, you shouldn't get involved with the Bechal. Um, and it's also a malacha. You know, it's, 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 it's a separate thing. Yeah, but, but, but the lighting of the fire particularly is... The, the Kabbalistic reason is because fire is, is extinguished in heaven. There's no, there's no, there's no uh, harsh fires in heaven. Yeah, so in the temple, because this holiness of the temple, that fire did not reflect the negative fire of heaven, that reflected a higher, more positive fire. So that was okay. But if you would light a fire, Bechol Moshe Beisechem, it says, if you light a fire at home, so then that fire could reflect the negative fire of heaven. Which, by the way, also it says... So there's, there's a good... the fire in Shabbos, though, in the best language. We've done before, so it's good. No, you, yeah. could, you, could, you could even... On yeah. Fire. yeah, 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 yeah. Because um, only in, in your homes you're not allowed to light fire. So the Tzemach Tzedek has a mimer that explains this beautifully, and it says that also uh, lighting a fire also means anger. Ha- getting angry on Shabbos is very bad. During the week it's not so good either, but on, on Shabbos, to get, to, to get angry on Shabbos, to light a fire of, of rage and anger on Shabbos is even worse than any other time, because it's not a time for divine anger. So... So it's just another example of how the timing of the mitzvah fits with the, the, the mitzvah itself. So learn Torah at midnight because that's a time when Hashem connects to Tzadikim. There's a special light then. Don't light a fire on Shabbos because that's a time when fires are not lit in the heavens. So don't, so don't do it at that time. You have to do what's appropriate for the time. And there are many other examples of this. But then base, the third line. Another, another system we find with mitzvahs is the exact opposite. Mahusa mitzvah hafchis mahusman asiyosa. That the mitzvah itself is the exact opposite to the timing, the energy of the time that it's done. And the mitzvah is coming to correct and reverse and sweeten the time. So it's not appropriate to the time, it's actually the opposite of what the time is. For example, Dugma the Dover, Tkiyas Shofar Rosh Hashanah. Blowing the Shofar on Rosh Hashanah. That on Rosh Hashanah we blow a Shofar. Why? 
Because you can't say the Gimel. It says in the Zayar, the Israel bind by Yom Adidina Shoifer, the Loi Karen begin the Lestabko Dina the Loi Beina. That it says in the Zayar that on on Rosh Hashanah you have to blow a Shoifer and not a horn. A horn is is a different instrument to a Shoifer because a horn. Uh, arouses judgment, whereas a shofar arou- arouses Hashem's kindness. And because Rosh Hashanah is a day of judgment, we don't want to arouse harsh judgment upon ourselves. We want to sweeten the judgment by blowing the shofar. The, the shofar has the, has the power of bringing Hashem's kindness down rather than him to be strict and judgmental against us. So the timing is a time of judgment, so we blow shofar to soften the judgment. We do something that's the opposite of the time. So sometimes mitzvahs are there to to sort of be in keeping with the mood. Sometimes they're there to reverse the mood. The timing of the mitzvah could be one way or the other. Now, second paragraph. So in our, in our issue, we're talking about giving tzedakah at night. So taking the first approach, which is that the mitzvah should fit with the time, it says in Kabbalah that in the morning, when the sun rises and light comes to the world, it's a time of chesed, of divine kindness. That's what the light represents. Just like nighttime, we said, is a time of strictness, of, of concealment. So morning is a time of kindness, of love. The sun coming up is the time of, of divine love. So therefore the Arizal writes, you have to give tzedakah every morning before davening. Before you daven the Shemun Esrei, before you daven Shachris, you should make sure to give tzedakah, because b'tzedek echsepanecha, that with justice, which is tzedakah, I will see your face. I'll come in front of you, Hashem. Because it's a time of kindness, of love, of, of divine bestowing, so we should bestow, do an act of kindness, which is tzedakah, before davening and asking for Hashem to bestow upon us His kindness. That's in Shachris. But then, u'bizman ha-mincha, he's manadinim ve'enu kol kach muchrach. The Arizal then writes, when it comes to mincha time, so Mincha, as the sun is setting and it's getting darker in the world, it's a time of judgments, not time of kindness anymore like the morning. So therefore, it's not so necessary to give tzedakah at Mincha. That's what the result says. It's not so, so necessary. Avol ein tzorich losses kodim tefilas arvis. But then the result says, but when it comes to Mayriv, there's no need to give tzedakah at all. Kamo shakris. Yan sha'atahu zman dinim koshim. Because now it's a time of harsh judgment. When it's dark, it's a time of divine harsh judgment. So therefore giving tzedakah is just it's not the right timing. So that's going like the first way that you do a mitzvah in the, in the time that's appropriate for it. In the time of, of kindness, do an act of kindness. In the afternoon when it's starting to get dark, it's heading towards judgment. So then you don't need so much to give tzedakah. You can, but you don't need to. And then a mayriv, it's a time of judgment, of darkness. Don't give tzedakah, it's not the right time. Which we'll have to explain. What, 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 what's so bad? Let's say you give tzedakah. What, what's, what's so wrong with it? We'll see. But then, from the second way of looking at things, which is that giving tzedakah is an act of chesed, to reverse the time of judgment. So, that it says elsewhere, this is based on... On, on the Kabbalah of the Rizal, but in, in a Siddur called Kol Yaakov, it says that because afternoon is judgment time, and we need to sweeten the judgment, we sweeten it through giving tzedakah at, at Mincha. So therefore, before Mincha you should give three times tzedakah, because Mincha is a time of judgment, where the sun is starting to go down. So therefore it says you should dafka give uh, tzedakah at Mincha, in order to reverse the judgment that is happening. So if at Mincha you have to give, so what about Mayriv? For sure you'd think you have to give. No, Aval, but Arvis ain't lit in tzedakah. But you should not give tzedakah at Mayriv. Ki oz hu shlita sadinim gumurim. Because then absolute judgment is in control. Harshness. Uchsiv loy sachsem shobedisha. And the Torah says you're not allowed to muzzle an ox when it's working. Now is the time when the, the powers of judgment are in control. It's not a time to get rid of them. You can't fight them at that time. What's to do with the, with the ox, muzzling an ox? Hmm? There's a prohibition that an ox, when an ox is doing his job, you can't, you can't muzzle it. You have to allow it to yeah. eat. Well, what it's saying is that it's the time of harsh judgment at night. 
Mm-hmm. And you can't try to do something to control that harsh judgment by trying to control the ox with the muzzle. Right. That's their time. It, that's when they're doing their work. Mm. That for whatever reason, there needs to be powers of judgment and harshness in the world. Nighttime is their jurisdiction. It's their time. It's their shift. And so at that time, you can't start trying to play with them and weaken them and fight against them. You have to let them be. Mincha time, when it's just edging towards that, then you, then you can try and fight them a bit. But once it's their time, once their, their time is up, is in, so then you, you can't touch them, you have to leave them, let them be. So therefore, Mariv, don't give tzedakah, because don't fight judgment at night. Minchi is a good time too, because that's when they're starting to, to get there, trying to try to beat them to it. <laughs> but once they're there, you've got to leave them alone. It's still the question, though. So we've got two, two reasons wh- now why not to give ma- tzedakah at Mariv. The, the first explanation was, well, of course not at Mariv, because it's not their time. Because it's not a time of chesed, it's a time of judgment. The second explanation is, well, that would be a great time to give, because it's a time of judgment, but you can't mess with them, because it's, it's, uh, it's their, their control, they're in control. So, so how, can we reconcile these two things? How can we explain it? It's like this. We'll understand this by looking at some of the words of the Ramaz. The Ramaz was, was Rav Moshe Zakus, who was a or Zakuta. He was an Italian commentary on the Zoyar, a Makubul. And so on Rai Mehem, the section of the Zohar, he says the following. When his Bible did Mil Maskal Zeh Hayom Tafresh Sadikei Vazel Shoyna, it's explained in one of the Friedrich Rebbe's Mamarim, this concept. Ha Klippas for Sitra Achra, Gam Hem Nivro. That the power of Klippa and Sitra Achra, which means the power of evil, of judgment, of harshness in the world, were also created beings. Hashem created certain powers of evil, negative energies, uh, harmful angels judgment, darkness, all these powers, Satan, they were created by Hashem. They're a part of creation. And so therefore they must have some life force. They have to be given a certain existence. That Hashem, because He wants to give us free choice, has to have powers of evil in the world. There has to be darkness and light, good and evil, black and white. There have to be two, have to be two paths in front of us. So the powers of evil have to have a certain existence, have a certain nourishment. So they're given a life, they're given existence, they, ha- they have uh, sustenance. But, the in- So there's two sources of life, the clipper, that powers of evil have. There's two ways they get their life. Aleph, Mashik, Nix of Love, Elion. One of them is what Hashem has a portion for them. There's a certain life force and energy that they're given. But, There's a second source of energy they have, and that's from sin. When people do evil and sin, that means they've taken their energy and they've misappropriated it towards evil. The powers of evil become strengthened through that. They get more energy, they're more strength, they're more powerful. So in other words, Hashem has apportioned evil to have a certain part in the world. When we do an act of evil, we strengthen that power of evil. It gets more nourishment. It feeds off, it feeds, it feeds off us. Is and it taking away from the chesed or is it giving more to the it's, well, it's both. It's both. It's misappropriating chesed and the power that could be for chesed, for, for giving and goodness, and it's going to the gurus, to the powers of strictness and, ju- and judgment. So, so evil has to exist. There's this strange balance in our cre- in our world that evil has to exist and given its place, but on the other hand, you don't want to give it more than it, it, its place. You don't want to strengthen it in any way. And every time we choose evil, we do an act of evil, we're taking our energy and we're giving it over to them. And that's what, so, so the powers of evil, the Kabbalah describes this in a very dramatic way, that the powers of evil are constantly trying to get us to sin. Why? Because that gets them more energy. They're trying to, to rip us off, to take, take our energy and, 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 and take it for themselves. Because that strengthens them. And every time you do evil, evil, the powers of evil are therefore stronger in the world and have a more influence on you and harder, it's harder to get away from it. Whereas if you do the right thing, then evil has its place, it still exists, but it doesn't have a hold on you. You're not strengthening it, you're not giving it any more than, than it deserves. So therefore that means that there's a certain amount of life force that evil is allowed, and you can't mess with that. You can't take away from evil what, it's, what Hashem has given it. But you shouldn't add to what Hashem has given it. So with that, that's why... You can't give tzedakah at night, 
Because night time is the time when the powers of Gvura, the powers of evil, have their strength. If you start messing with that and trying to turn it around and make Chesed at the time of Gvura, that's not fair. Yeah, Hashem is created in a certain way. But that's not giving Gvura more power if you did that, because you only give Gvura more power by doing the wrong thing. Correct. Right? But you, so you can't give Gvura more, you're not allowed to give Gvura more power by doing a sin. But you're also not allowed to battle against right. the power of Gvura and reduce its power yeah. by doing chesed, by doing kindness at, at night. Yeah. You have to leave it alone. Some people also have a thing not to cut their fingernails at night yeah. or hair, hair at night. Yeah. Why? Because hair and fingernails also are Gvuras, are like de- a, a dead part of ourselves. To mm-hmm. cut fingernails, the idea of cutting your fingernails is to, to, to limit the Gvuras. Cutting the hair as well is to limit the Gvuras. You can't do that at night because that's their time. And at that time, you can't encroach upon them. Is there a limit for chesed? What do you mean? Like in the day. Like, is there anything no. that you could do that's going to counteract? No, no, no. Although there are certain things we do. For example, on Yom Kippur, the, the, the uh, scapegoat, Cyril Azazel. So it says in Kabbalah that what that really was, was giving evil its portion. That evil has to have an existence. And even on, on Yom Kippur, we're trying to conquer evil and banish evil and rid ourselves of all evil, but we give the Cyril Azazel, this, this goat that is over the cliff, to Azazel. Azazel is the power of evil. We're saying, this is your portion. You need to exist, but, but no more than necessary. My well. yeah, correct. Yeah. That's also, there's like a little portion of, of, of evil that it has its thing. It has its place. It says also breaking of the glass at a, at a chuppah is because the powers of evil try very much to interrupt a holy event like a chuppah. So we smash a glass, we say, okay, there's your bit, there's the, 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 the Satan's bit in the, in the wedding, there's the, 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 mis- the bad thing that happens at the wedding. We broke a glass, you can leave us alone. So it's got to have its part, but no more. We break two glasses. Break that's giving it too much. Oh, that, well, that's because at that time we break the plate, and then right. it's two, two different parts. So, so therefore, now it makes sense why at Mayriv you don't give tzedakah, because you're not allowed to encroach on the powers of Gvuris. Right? Also, it, it, this is reflected <coughs> in something it says in the Talmud Yerushalmi, the in Tractate Shkalim. Rav Chinon Bar Papa have a muffling mitzvah tzedakah belelia. It says the story that Rav Chinon Bar Papa used to give a lot of tzedakah at night. He used to, he used to distribute tzedakah to people. And because he didn't want to embarrass the people he's giving, so he used to go quietly at night and give tzedakah in people's houses. Very, very nice thing. Sorry, But one night he was doing this, he was distributing tzedakah, and the head spirit, the head evil spirit, came and blocked him. And the spirit said to him, Haven't you taught us? Haven't we we've been taught by you? that you're not allowed to encroach on somebody else's uh, business. Hasagas Gvul is, is the law in Torah that says that you're not allowed to uh, go into somebody else's business. You're not allowed to do unfair competition to wipe somebody else out of business. You've taught us that halacha, and here you are giving tzedakah at night. This is what the head evil spirit, or the head of the spirits, said to Rabbi Chinan Bar Papa, who's going to give tzedakah at night. So, that's what, that's, that was the story. Now, the Mefarshim, Valpian now moving Pshutas. We can understand simply what, is, what does it mean? You can't give tzedakah at night because uh, that's chesed and it's a time of gvura. In Torah, the Pirush Karben Eida, Sheitana, he b'mnei The The Mefarshim on the commentaries on the Yerushalmi, they're trying to, try to understand what's tas, Hasagas Gvul here. What does it mean that you're encroaching on his property? What does he mean by that? So one of the commentaries says, because you're going out at night. There's an idea that you shouldn't walk around the streets at night, because the night is a time of evil. But we understand, no, it's not just that. It's that he's giving tzedakah at night. That is, that is hitting evil in the face. That, that's why it's wrong. Um, so it's added in another siddur, another Kabbalistic siddur um, of Harash Marashkov. He writes even more. Ki ain litan tzedakah ba'arvis. You should not give tzedakah at night. Ki oz hi layla vadinim govrim. Because that is a time, it's, it's night time, it's a time when the dinin, the harsh judgments are strong. Vyesh pachad machizis chetzonim. And it could be that by you giving tzedakah at that time, you could be attacked by the chetzonim, by the powers of evil, that they will actually nourish from your goodness. That, that it will actually increase their power. Not just that it will d- reduce their power unfairly, 
but they may actually misappropriate your mitzvah, it might increase their power. So, not, so he says not only is giving Tanaka at night unfair because it's taking away the power of the Gvuras, it might be the opposite. They could latch onto that mitzvah that you did and increase their power. It'll increase the powers of evil in the world. So, does that mean that if somebody knocks on our door and asks for tzedakah at night, we say, sorry, come back in the morning. You, you can't do it. We don't want to increase the powers of evil or unfairly take away their energy. So we'll see, no. Not, not quite. Look at the next section. Bottom of the page, 293. Now, a question we can ask on this. Tzedakah is a mitzvah that is not time-bound. There's no time given to the mitzvah of tzedakah. So how can you say that you can't do a mitzvah at night because it's going to add powers of evil mm-hmm. when the mitzvah applies to you? You have a mitzvah at night. A mitzvah that's only a daytime mitzvah, shaking the lulav, putting on tefillin, okay. But a mitzvah that applies at any time, how can you say that, no, 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 don't do it at night? The Torah says you have a mitzvah to give. It's not limited by the Torah. So you could seemingly answer, Maybe the Arizal is only talking about giving tzedakah before davening. That you sh- that before davening, you have to do it in the morning. You can do it at Mincha, but you shouldn't do it before Ma'ariv. Maybe he's just saying before Ma'ariv you shouldn't give, but if after Ma'ariv, you can give. Just at that time, you shouldn't give. But that makes no sense. The reasoning that he's given is because of the powers of evil. That applies all night. It's not a pattern just before my roof. So you can't give that answer. Bottom section. So maybe you could say like this. There's two types of tzedakah. There's two ways of giving tzedakah. Aleph, one of them is that you see a poor person, you bump into a poor person who asks you for tzedakah. On about such a person it says, you should not close your heart, you must immediately give, as it says in Shulchan Aruch, in the Code of Jewish Law, that you must give tzedakah to anyone who asks. You should not delay, you should not close your heart, you should not refuse, you should always give tzedakah to anybody who asks. And you learn that from the story in the Gemara of Nochem Gamzu. Nochem Gamzu was a great tzaddik, but he was su- suffering very terribly at the end of his life. His students asked him why, and he said because once he was traveling with a huge load of, of stuff um, on his uh, donkey, and a poor person asked him for charity, and he said, sure, just give me a minute to unload my donkey. And in the meantime, the poor person died. And so Nochem Gamzu cursed himself and said that my, my feet and my eyes and everything that didn't help you out should be cursed. And so he ended up being riddled with disease all through his body. And he was self-imposed, but he said because he didn't immediately react to this poor person who asked for money and he died. So the Gemara, so the, the Shulchan Aruch quotes that story and says, you learn from here, you have to immediately react to anyone who asks you for tzedakah. That's one way of giving tzedakah. Base. But a second way of giving tzedakah a person should never stop giving tzedakah, even if there's no poor person right in front of you asking. Right, so it says in Shulchan Aruch that you should give tzedakah every day, and if, if there's no one who asks you for tzedakah, so then go out and seek it. Or what we do today is you have a pushka, you have a tzedakah box, and you put in every day, and then and, and it, gets, it gets collected. So the mitzvah tzedakah is not just when somebody comes and asks you, it's also... Every day, even if no one's there to ask. So, in the writings of the Arizal where it says, do not give tzedakah at night, it's talking about the second type of tzedakah, the tzedakah that you initiate, no one asked you, you're just giving tzedakah. Like before Ma'ariv, you're going to go and put the money in the pushka. No one asks you to, you're just doing your habit of giving tzedakah. On that it says, don't do it at night time, because that will encroach upon the powers of evil unfairly. But, but in the first case, where somebody comes and asks you for tzedakah, there's no difference between nighttime and daytime. The same obligation applies to always give tzedakah and always, always immediately respond. As it says, do not close your heart. So, if you get an email in the evening from Okay, so an email, you can't compare that to Nochemish Gamzu's case. Nochemish Gamzu, there was a guy in front of him who asked for tzedakah, and by him turning around and unloading the thing, the guy died. 
if somebody sends you an email, if they're desperate to, to eat, that's not the way to ask for tzedakah to send an email. It, that they're going to die if they don't eat on the spot. I'm not. I'm not talking about they need food. So yeah, you're right. So I think I think there there probably would not apply. <laughs> Can I ask one question? Yeah, sure. The fact that tzedakah is not time-bound, does that have any tie-in with Shabbos then? Because if it's not time-bound, how come we can't give on Shabbos? Is it you can't. You can give food. You can give food on Shabbos. Okay. Is it money? Money is muktzah. Money is Yeah. Tzedakah. Is that, is that still tzedakah? That's not like. Is that tzedakah actually having to give like actual money? On the contrary, it says that giving food is better than giving money in tzedakah. I'm saying if that's what they need, if that's what the person needs, because then they don't have to go and buy the food, they can eat it straight away. So, so, so giving someone somewhere to sleep if they need it, is it up as well? Giving someone? Somewhere to sleep if they need it. Like yeah, a, yeah, absolutely. Roof over their head. Absolutely, and, yeah. And what about yeah. like if you give some <coughs> robot vacuum cleaner to clean the house? <laughs> that helps um, yeah, but then they have to get rid of it when it breaks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if someone asks you for money... That, uh, that they need for food, but you know they're not going to spend it on food that they, they need. Okay, so what are they going to spend it on? Alcohol, drugs. Maybe. Okay, so if you if you, if you know if you know that for a fact, yeah. so then the question is, giving them money, are you helping them or not helping them? It's a, it's a separate yeah. d- question. Um, and generally, if somebody's asking for tzedakah, but you have a strong suspicion that they're not a worthy recipient that they don't actually need it, so then the obligation to respond is not. But only if you know that, like, yeah. or you have good information on that, not just because you suspect it. So we give the benefit of the doubt always, uh, but if it's not really tzedakah, it's not really helping them, then you wouldn't be obligated. So, so then, yeah? So then my son, tzedakah are two different things. Because you can't give... Okay, so the Rebbe then continues in the second paragraph. We'll do a couple more, more lines. Ve'ena hachis, the soy soy from nei hatam de laila zman didin kanal ve'al tasik vul reyacha maishno ben ofen alaf the base. One second. If the reason why giving tzedak at night is because you're going to weaken the powers of evil and you're not allowed to do that, so then what's the difference if somebody asks you for tzedak or you're going to give it to them? Either way, you're going to encroach upon the powers of evil. So surely, when somebody comes and asks for tzedakah at night, you should say, I can't do that because now that will imbalance the, the powers of evil. So the Rebbe says, no. The Shani Tuv, it's very different. If min ha if from heaven they've sent you a poor person to ask you for tzedakah, that's a sign that you giving this person tzedakah will not encroach upon the powers of evil. Because Hashem, who is looking after the powers of evil and making sure they have enough nourishment, is also looking after this person and making sure he has enough nourishment. And so if Hashem has sent you a poor person right now, if, but if, with Hashkach pratis, you've been faced with somebody who needs money at that time. So therefore that means that Hashem is saying, don't worry, the balance of evil in, in, in the world will remain even after you've done this good act. Because... This is a fascinating idea. As far as you're concerned, the fact that this person came to you now is Ashkoch practice. It's sent from, he- from heaven. As far as he's concerned, he might have planned it. You know, that's what he wanted to do. But as far as you're concerned, that's Ashkoch practice. That's the divine plan that this person should come to you at this moment. So if Hashem is sending you a poor person at night time, it must mean that by, you do have an obligation to give him, and that will not in any way reduce the powers of evil in the world. They'll be fine. What if the person that's coming is not poor? Yeah. They're not because they're coming for themselves, yeah. for poor people. They're coming to raise money for school. Okay, so, so tzedakah includes not only giving to the poor, it also giving to an institution that itself can't, can't make money. Just like in, in, in times of the temple, giving to the temple, giving to the Beis Mikdash, that was a, part, of, part of Meiser, part of the, the, the various donations you gave was to give to a koyan or give to the Beis Mikdash. So, it doesn't, so that's also considered tzedakah. Is it, is it your obligation to find out whether it's a legitimate cause or not? Like, you know how, if someone, if you grab a I know sometimes they have, like, they show you or whatever. But if you're giving to so many people, like, if they come in, you know. Yeah, so, so generally, if you're giving, if, if you're depending on this as your maisa, then, then yeah, you should, you should know that it's going to a real tzedakah, otherwise it's not tzedakah. Yeah. Um, 
but to give a couple of bucks to somebody, it's not necessarily. It's a this guy's coming, so therefore he needs. No, Hashgach Pratis, then you can say the same if, 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 if some uh, swindler, scammer comes to you and says Hashgach Pratis, you have to buy. No, if, if it's a real tzedakah, it's a real tzedakah, if not, can then... Can you buy a ticket to see uh, a tzedakah?